Good morning. It's always a, a real joy to me to be back with you here at Forge Road to see your faces and uh, see so many who are very, very dear to me and to see you all pressing on for the Lord here at Forge Road Bible Chapel. Our text for this morning is Psalm 121. So if you'd open your Bibles to Psalm 121, that's where we'll be, be looking together this morning. Before we read, I'll just mention, I'm, I'm not going to have much of an introduction to this sermon. Uh, after we read, we'll jump right in. Uh, I knew I would forget to turn on the mic. There we go. Uh, it's become a tradition with me. Um, won't have much of an introduction, uh, trying to draw you in to the message or convince you of the relevance of this text. I'm assuming that the last five months will convince you of the relevance of this text, and we're already uh, prepared for it. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. This is a song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. As we begin, I want to suggest to you a simple four-part outline to Psalm 121. First, we find there is a longing expressed, a longing expressed. We find that in the first part of verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the hills. I'm calling this a longing expressed. Psalm 121 has been called the traveler's psalm or the pilgrim psalm. All the songs of ascent, starting with Psalm 120, uh, we understand were typically sung by uh, the Israelites as they made their annual pilgrimage up to Jerusalem uh, for the feasts, and, and this is one of those psalms, and that's why it's called a traveler's or a pilgrim psalm. This is the expression of one traveling to Jerusalem, the city of God, the place of God's dwelling in Israel, the place where God was worshipped in the temple. So the pilgrim on his way to Jerusalem lifts up his eyes to the longed for destination. That's the idea. He's, he's on this trip to Jerusalem. Uh, he lifts up his eyes from a distance and sees those hills surrounding Jerusalem. And that is his longed for destination. Now, these opening words, uh, I believe, for us as Christians, should be understood much like the words of the old Baptist hymn, On Jordan's Stormy Banks. Do you know that song? On Jordan's Stormy Banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We're pilgrims, aren't we? We're on a journey. This world is, is not our home. We are travelers as believers, and we're longing for our ultimate and final destination where uh, we look for this fair and happy land, where our true possessions lie. I lift up my eyes, the psalmist says, to the destination where special joys and privileges and blessings wait for me. And we're like that too. Point number two in the psalm, there is a concern raised. We saw first uh, the longing expressed, but secondly, a concern raised. Second half of verse one. From where does my help come? I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? And it is right to put this in the form of a question. Uh, I think the old King James Version has contributed to some confusion by phrasing this as a statement rather than a question. The old King James reads, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And what's the confusion that could cause? The confusion is my help is coming from the hills. 
right? That's not the idea at all. The truth is, the psalmist is a traveler, a pilgrim. His eyes are lifted to the longed-for destination, but he's not there yet. And the journey is a dangerous one. And I think we could talk about it historically, that journey from various parts of the surrounding region of Jerusalem. It would have been different than today. It would have been a dangerous journey for many of those pilgrims. He's not there yet. So this question, this concern expressed, from, from where does my help come? How am I going to get there? How am I going to make it? How will I arrive safely to my destination, to the end of my journey? The concern expressed is essentially this. I need help. I need help. Do you ever feel that way? How am I going to make it? (laughs) How am I going to make it to the end? Seems awfully dangerous, these times in which we live. This side of heaven. Again, the hymn I mentioned earlier on Jordan's stormy banks acknowledges this reality. Um, No chilling winds, no poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore. Sickness, sorrow, pain, and death are felt and feared no more. But that's our destination, right? We're not there yet. That's what we're longing for. But this side of heaven, this side of the Jordan... Chilling winds, poisonous breath, sickness, sorrow, pain, and death are right there with us, and a thousand other dangers beside. So we need help, don't we? Where will it come from? Point number three, there is an answer supplied. And let me just anticipate, we're already on point number three. I said there were four. Point number four is going to be a little longer. I know you were hoping we'd be done by 11.35, but (laughs) point number three, an answer supplied, verse 2a, my help comes from the Lord. He's longing for Jerusalem. He's conscious of his need for help to get there. Where will that help come from? Where will he turn? What will he trust in and rely on to finish the journey, to arrive safely at the destination? Will he take matters into his own hands? Will he trust in his own strength? We were reminded of this in breaking of bread, weren't we? Will he trust in his own wisdom, his own ingenuity? Will he rely on his money? Will he rest in his large army, his strong horses, his iron chariots? Will he follow the successful people in the world, so-called, and try their gods, That was a frequent temptation for Old Covenant Israelites, wasn't it? Looking around and saying, well, well, they they won their battles. Let's let's worship their gods. They, They must be helping them a lot. Will he put all his hope in family and friends? Will we put our hopes in politics, political leaders? Here the psalmist shows us, I believe, how Faith works in such times. In these moments, what do we do as believers? What do we do? Where do we turn? I believe this is how faith works on the journey. We take ourselves in hand. We have to do that, you know. We take ourselves in hand, and we don't listen to ourselves. Rather, we preach to ourselves at times like this. Do you understand what I'm saying? It can be dangerous to always be listening to yourself and all the voices from outside that are stirring up yourself and you're hearing all kinds of things and thinking all kinds. At times like that, we take ourselves in hand and don't listen to ourselves. We preach to ourselves. We preach truth to ourselves. And not just any truth. We preach truth theology to ourselves. Now, don't worry if, if you're thinking, okay, here's where the preacher who spent a little bit of time studying this week is going to make it all complicated and 
difficult to understand and it's going to be all you know hard to grasp and impractical and don't let that word theology make you think that at all this is the most practical stuff in the world and it's simple really it's not complicated when we talk about theology what are we talking about we're just talking about truth about god and that's what we preach to ourselves Truth about God. As the people of God, it's so important that we regularly lift our eyes and see that we have a very big God. That's what I mean. That's all I mean by theology. We have a very big God. We, I believe, as the people of God, are at our best this side of heaven when God is big and everything else is small and we see him as all the help we will ever need. So we have a longing expressed, a concern raised, an answer given now in the rest of the psalm and slightly longer than the first three points. There is a specific truth developed, a very specific truth about God developed, and this is from verse 2b through verse 8. From verses 2b through 8, the psalmist reflects on this idea that his help comes from the Lord, right? That was the answer supplied. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. But for the rest of the psalm, he's, he's reflecting on that. And as he does, there's one truth about God in particular that grabs his attention and becomes the central theme of the rest of the psalm. It's expressed in a number of places, but look at verse 5a. This is the one truth, the specific truth that the psalmist is focused on. It's this, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your keeper. So how is it that the Lord helps us? The Lord is our keeper. Six times in verses 3 through 8, the same Hebrew word appears. It means to keep, to watch over, to protect, to preserve. And that's why I read the ESV version. It does a good job of bringing that out by translating that word the same way every time that it occurs in those verses. Verse 3, he who keeps you. Verse 4, he who keeps Israel. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. Verse 7a, the Lord will keep you. Verse 7b, he will keep your life. Verse 8, the Lord will keep your going out and coming in. Watch over, protect, preserve. The Lord is my help, the psalmist says, but how? He is the one who keeps me. He is the one who protects me. He is the one who preserves me. He is the one who watches over me. I want to notice with you briefly four ways that he develops this truth in verses 2b through 8. How is God our keeper? And you might maybe think about this as like God's resume as our keeper. You know, he doesn't have to have a resume. He doesn't have to prove himself to be a good keeper. But let's say we needed a keeper and we advertise we need a keeper and God applies for the job and he sends in his resume. And here's a good description of uh, four aspects of why God is a good keeper to have. First, the Lord is an all-powerful keeper, verse 2b. The one who helps me and keeps me is, what? The maker of heaven and earth. The one who keeps me is the maker of heaven and earth. Now, maybe that thought was, was prompted to the psalmist as he looked on those hills, and what the hills taught him was not that his help came from the hills, but his help comes from the one who made the hills. As one has put it, what we need is not the gods of nature, but nature's God. Consider, brethren, the, the vast comfort that comes to us as the people of God, that our God is the creator of all things. This is truth that we should frequently preach to ourselves. I, I understand that uh, there was an earthquake in North Carolina this morning. 
5.1 in Sparta, North Carolina, that was felt in my hometown of Medan. So when the earth is literally shaking, where do you, where do you look for help? And then, by the way, I don't think there was any destruction or death. But uh, literally, figuratively, right, when the world seems to be shaking, isn't it an immense comfort that our God's the maker of it all? He's bigger than it all. The power to call the worlds into existence by a word belongs to him. Is there anything he cannot do? The wisdom and the knowledge to create such a vast and complex and beautiful, perfectly designed universe belongs to him. He's not created. He has no beginning and no end. He's a living God and not a dead, inanimate object like the gods of, of this world. As the creator, he owns it all, right? It all belongs to him. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All things rightfully belong to him. As Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. And referring to the stars, he says, Who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Isn't that a comfort to you? If not one star is missing night by night because God himself is calling them out by name. Do you think he's unaware of what you need? Do you think he lacks the power to help you in your time of need? As creator, he upholds all things. He sustains all things. He directs all things by his good and holy providence. And here's the comfort for the believer. If you are his by faith in Christ, this God is your God, but not just a distant you know, force that created all things that it's hard to get to know. And you know, we feel like we're just talking to the ceiling whenever we pray. No, who is he? He's our father. If we're in Christ, this creator God is our daddy. <laughs> Abba, Father, he knows us intimately, he loves us, he cares for us, and all power and authority is his as the creator. So the one who helps you and keeps you is the creator of heaven and earth, an all-powerful creator. Next, the psalmist reflects on the truth that the Lord is an ever-watchful keeper. Verses 3 and 4, look there again. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. How can we be confident that no matter where we are, no matter what kind of danger we're facing, the Lord will not allow our foot to slip? How can we be confident of that? Well, the psalmist tells us it's because he never sleeps. He never sleeps. Now again, it's tempting to kind of think, well, well, of course he never sleeps. He's God. But what's the implication of that? What's, what's the point? Our God, our keeper, is not a finite creature bound by human weakness and limitation. He doesn't need to sleep. You remember when Elijah was mocking the prophets of Baal, and uh, their God was not responding, and Elijah picks up on that. He says, well, maybe he's, maybe he's taking a nap, or maybe he's gone to relieve himself. Pro Elijah was pretty edgy. <laughs> but that's not our God, is it? He's a living God, and he's not a man that he should sleep, that he should need a break. I find that tremendously comforting. <laughs> <laughs> I need a God who won't ever get tired of me. His watchful, loving eye is always upon us. He's everywhere present. He's never distracted. He's never preoccupied. 
He's never the watchman who falls asleep on the job. He's ever alert and ready to come to our aid. Our keeper, believer, is an infinite being, infinite in his capacity to remain attentive always, and infinite in his capacity to be attentive to all the needs of all his people all of the time. I, again, it, I know it's simple. It's kind of Sunday school kind of things about God, but don't we have to get the implications of this? Do you see how practical this is? I mean, it doesn't do any good to know this and, and it not impact the way we're living in these days, in these times. I just, I love that thought. My God is able to hear and understand and respond to all the prayers of all of his people all at the same time. Isn't that a wonderful thought? He can handle it. He doesn't have to say, you, you all wait because I, I need to take care of the Chinese today or I need to take care of the Sudanese today. No, all of his people praying all at once and he can handle it. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Now, again, that's a sobering thing to think about in some ways. But remember, for those who are in Christ, for those who are in Christ, Psalm 139 is a great blessing. Because in Christ, we have nothing to fear, right? God already knows everything. We've already admitted it. <laughs> We've confessed it. And we don't have to be afraid of our God knowing everything about us. It's actually a great comfort to us that he knows everything about us. And in his son, he has forgiven us of all that would separate us from him. There's no more alienation. There's no more resentment. God is not angry with us. He loves us because of the blood of his son. So we can rejoice that he even knows our thoughts before we're even conscious of them. This God is our God, if you're a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. The one who helps you, believer, is an all-powerful keeper and an ever-watchful keeper. And I know that we suffer very severe trials this side of heaven. And there are times when we're tempted to think, where are you, Lord? But you know, there is a sense in which we never actually and truly have to ask that question. He's always there. He's right there with us, watching over us, keeping us, never taking a break. Well, next we observe this with the psalmist that the Lord is an all-sufficient keeper, verses 5 through 7. He's an all-powerful keeper, an ever-watchful keeper. He is, thirdly, an all-sufficient keeper. Verses 5 through 7, the emphasis is on the capacity of the Lord himself to meet our every need. Look at 5a. The Lord himself is your keeper, not another. He needs no representative. He needs no intermediary. When we need shade from something that threatens us, he himself is our shade. He doesn't need to send a plant like he did for Jonah to grow up and provide shade for the prophet Jonah. He doesn't need to do that. He stands between his people and that which comes against us, that which threatens us. His care over us protects us at all times, both day and night. I think that's the point of the sun by day and the moon by night, every moment, every event, every detail that makes up our lives and becomes the occasions for struggle, he's right there with us, protecting us from every threat. His care over us is complete, it's expansive, it extends to every part of our lives and every need we have. Look at the text. He will keep you from all evil. 
He will keep your life. Our God knows us. He knows where we're vulnerable and weak. He knows the particular challenges that threaten us. And he will not let those threats overcome us. Again, it it would be wrong to read this psalm or any other part of the Bible as promising us um, no threats, right? No hardships, no difficulties, no obstacles, no challenges, no difficult things that come against us and, and cause us fear. The Bible never promises that we'll be free of those things. But what's the promise of this text? What's the comfort of this text? Our God will keep us in those things. In the midst of those things, he will not let them overcome us and destroy us. He's our keeper. He's our shade. He's our shield. He's our defender. He is our captain fighting for for us against every threat and every foe. We will not be ultimately overcome because our God keeps us. Well, the fourth observation about the Lord as our keeper we find in verse 8. The Lord is an everlasting keeper. Everything that's involved in our journey to heaven, all our going out and our coming in, will be carried out under the watch care of our God all the way to the end. All the way to the end. Have you ever wished that as soon as you got saved, God just translated you to heaven? You didn't have to deal with all this pilgrimage stuff? It's it's mysterious. His purpose is for us. Why does he leave us? And, and not everyone has a long journey time-wise. Some, some are believers for a very short period of time. The thief on the cross had a very short pilgrimage, didn't he? But for many of us, it's decades. It's a lifetime of, of perseverance, right? Endurance, that word implies it ain't easy. And God calls us to that. But the comfort of this text is that God is with us all the way to the end. Our eternal, unchangeable God is committed to keep his people for eternity. The point of all this is not that God, again, prevents us from experiencing trials. The point is that he's committed to keeping us through every trial and danger and that forever our savior told us this right john 16 33 in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer i have overcome the world and therefore the world will not ultimately overcome you my people love the words of john 10 27 and following jesus said my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you. I'm never going to let you go. And nothing can pry my fingers off of you. The Lord is my help, the psalmist says. He is an all-powerful, ever-watchful, all-sufficient, everlasting keeper of his people. That's the truth that occupies the psalmist and fills him with comfort and confidence and peace and hope for the journey that's still ahead of him. So the question for us today is this. Is that truth, that theology, big to you? Is it big to you? Is it big to me? And this is where we really have to take God's word. I think you were singing earlier, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. You know, that doesn't just happen because we read it and understand it. It's taking ourselves in hand and preaching this truth to ourselves, especially in the battle, right, of our thoughts and our emotions. And when we feel the various pressures of the world coming against us and our thoughts start to run in every direction and 
Our emotions begin to get stirred up. Is this going to be bigger than all of that to us? And will we be people who reflect a genuine trust in the Lord, in the way that we're living, in the way that we're speaking, in the way that we are emoting day by day, in the way that we're tweeting or posting or whatever it is that we do? Do people know when they see us, they hear us, they read what we, what we write, that this is our God? You know, and the world might be going crazy, but we're okay. We're okay. I'm not going to act like this isn't true. You know, of all the sad things going on in our world today, isn't it tragic if the people of God act like this world is all there is and we're just terrified of what's going to happen? And I'm not minimizing the craziness, okay? And the real challenges and the real fears and things like that that we deal with. But at the end of the day... Are we going to act like this is true or not? You know? The, the ultimate outcome is determined by our Lord, our keeper. And I don't pretend that that's easy. I, I really don't, if I sound exercised or loud. Or, I'm fighting this battle right there with you. <laughs> But that's the point, isn't it? Is it going to be big to us? Is it real? Is it bearing actual fruit in our lives, in our relationships, in our hearts, when we lie our heads down on our pillows at night? I'm I'm, I'm now in the older category, you know, and you young people enjoy it while you can sleep 10 hours straight because you just can't when you get older. (laughs) Because what happens? You wake up at 3 in the morning, and what happens? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. What's going to happen tomorrow? But God gives his people sleep, the Bible says. Go back to Psalm 3 and Psalm 4. Because we trust in him. A story was once told of a captain of a ship many, many years ago who was commanding a ship from Liverpool to New York, and he had his whole family on board on that particular journey, and one night everyone was asleep, and a great storm came up and and, uh, overtook the ship and actually turned the ship on its side, and so when that happens, of course, everything that's not uh, lashed down was flying all over the place and people were falling out of their beds and getting up and throwing on their clothes and preparing for the worst. There was great fear and panic. And one of the ch- children on that boat was that captain's eight-year-old daughter. And of course, she woke up with everybody else and she said, what's the matter? And someone said, uh, th- there's a great storm that's overtaken the ship and we're, we're, we're in fear of, of our lives. And the girl said, is father on the deck? And the person replied, yes, your father is on the deck. And she laid her head back down on her pillow and went fast to sleep. Now you say, well, that's a child, right? That's a child. Of course, a child is like that. Well, isn't that precisely the point? What happens to us when we get older as Christians? (laughs) And we get too sophisticated to trust God like a child. This is the point, isn't it? Is our father on the deck? Is he? Is he? Do you think there are forces at work in our world and even in our country that have control over the ultimate outcome, who are stronger than our father? Do you think our father will let those for- I mean, there are powerful forces in the world, no doubt. The devil is a formidable foe. I think you sang about him earlier. But a mighty fortress is our God. Right? Is is Father on the deck? That's what matters. Can we lay our heads back down and go to sleep and trust him? He will keep us. He will keep us. If you want to use another picture, I love, I was thinking about this recently, how we need the stories we learned when we were three, right? Jesus in the boat with the disciples, and a storm comes up, and what are they doing? What we do, we panic. 
Lord, don't you care? We're sinking. And Jesus wakes up and says, stop. So what's the point of that story? The point is, is Jesus in the boat with you? If Jesus is in the boat with you, then it doesn't really matter what's going on around you. You're not going to sink. So we need to make sure that we're connecting our personal faith to this truth about God, this big view of God in every point in our lives along the way. And, and again, I don't mean to minimize what's happening in our world and in our country. Serious, serious concerns. But our God forbid that we, his people, would act as if this is not true about him. Please remember that. You know, get, get your news from the news, but don't get your emotions from the news. Get your emotional life from Psalm 121. Right? You, you see what I'm saying? That's what we have to do. That's practically taking the truth of God, preaching it to ourselves, and living by that, being controlled by that, and not by all the things that are coming against us. This is where we get calm and peace, confidence, not controlled by fear and anxiety, cheerfulness, contentedness, come what may. An active kind of dependence on our God where we, do tur we turn away from the horses and the chariots, right? The things of this world that we tend to want to hope in, we want to trust in. If only this would happen or this outcome of the election or whatever it is. We want to hope in those things and we're always disappointed. And it just reminds us again and again, turn away, turn to God. He is your keeper. He is your help. Well, may God bless this word to us to help us to trust in our God and to walk in confidence and peace in him. Amen. Let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.